Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this webinar where we are going to look at the type two self-assessments, particularly focused on the PCSE online submission route. Uh, my name is Katrina Venerous. I work in the GP pensions team here at PCSE, and I have my colleagues from the communications team supporting me this evening, Debbie and Kat, and I also have Janet from NHS England as well. So thanks to everybody for coming along. The format for this evening, we've got quite a lot to get through, as you can imagine. So we have an hour and we will cover, I've got a presentation slide pack that I'll cover what we think are, are the key points in terms of submissions and some of the, the questions that we've either been asked on other earlier webinars or we know that they are questions that come into our customer service centre. So try and give you as much information as possible, but we'll also be sharing various links and so on for you to go and check out the, the guidance from NHS pensions and the, the guidance and help tools that we've produced here at PCSE. So as I say, lots to get through. If the test environment is playing game and allowing me, then I'll also spend a little bit of time showing you some actual navigation around the system just to get the better feel for how easy it is. And we'll squeeze in some questions. We won't obviously be able to deal with questions of an individual nature, but my colleagues will be looking at the types of questions that you're asking and, and trying to pull out the key themes and the things that we think can, we can deal with in the event tonight. So I'll not dwell on the content. So you can see there's a lot of individual bits that we're going to try and cover off in the session. But I'm just going to start looking at who really needs to complete a type two form. So as people will know, there's obviously type one annual certificates and there's type two self-assessments that NHS pensions require certain pension scheme members to complete. We get a lot of questions from people about who needs to complete what. So we've made this little grid. GPs who do locum work only don't need to fill out any annual or end of year return at all. This evening we're talking about type two, so that's the light green colour. So if you're a GP who's salaried in practice, if you're salaried and you do either solo or locum work or both, then yep, you have to complete the type two. If you only do solo work, you have to complete the type two or solo and locum work, you have to complete the type two. But like I said, if you do locum work only, then you don't complete the end of year form. And anyone who is a partner in a practice, regardless of the other work that they do, then they would complete a type one form. And we did deliver a webinar on type one forms on Monday evening this week and that along with the type two webinars will be published at the end of this week so that people who weren't able to attend or if anybody wants to refer back to any of the points that we covered then we'll be able to see be able to go back and, and check on that so they will be available very shortly if we just move on to the next slide then what we've tried to do here is just set out the timeline you know particularly for people who are quite new to this, you know, who haven't had to complete end of year certificates before, then it's just important to understand how the, the timetable works. So there are really three parties in this end of year process. The forms themselves are published by NHS Pensions. They publish them on their website. That was early December this year. Then PCSE systems have been undergoing development and the PCSE online forms go live tomorrow evening. So it'll be late in the evening. So effectively it'll be Friday, so the 27th of January. The deadline is, as always, 28th of February for submission of the forms. And then there's a period of time up until the deadline that NHS pensions set PCSE of mid-June, where we go through and process the certificates and forms and update the pensions online system. There's then a period where NHS pensions make their own updates and the, the TRS is, is refreshed and there's a date to be confirmed in August, but by the end of August, then that's when, if records are up to date, then that's when you'll be able to see the TRS refreshed. So that 
is how the, the timetable works just for anyone who's not quite sure. So PCSE processes certificates and update pensions online where there are no gaps in the records, then you will be able to see your refreshed TRS by the end of August. Just a couple of key points really. I've obviously mentioned the submission deadline. It is kind of dependent on us receiving the forms completed in full, accurately, no missing details, etc. If there are any errors or if there's any missing information, then we'll do our best to get things processed for you and, and to liaise with you in time for that June cutoff for the August TRS refresh. But as you can appreciate then, if there are inaccuracies or other issues, then that can cause delays and it may be a later refresh of the, the TRS that your records update. Then the other important point really is around the way that the NHS pensions, pensions online system updates. It only updates if sequential certificates are processed and records are updated for each year in, in sequence. So if we are going to be processing 21, 22 forms in the coming weeks and months, that can be processed successfully through PCSE online. That's the first hurdle. But if for a particular GP there's been a gap, say maybe 2017-18, there was an issue trying to get reconciled and that's still outstanding, then although on PCSE online you'll be able to see all of the certificates that have been processed with the 17-18 outstanding, from a pensions online DRS perspective, then if that gap is at 1718, effectively your record will only show as being up to date to March 2017. So the listing screen that you have access to on PCSE Online allows you to check which certificates have been processed for you. So if you do have any missing years, do look out for any communications that we've sent in regards to clarifications or if you haven't submitted that at all, then when you can have a look at getting those forms sorted so that we can then get your records updated. As I say, the sequential update is just how the pensions online system works. So that is some of the key bits just to point out by way of introduction. Just want to go straight into then PCSE online itself. If we, before we go as far as talking about the self-assessment screen, then the first thing to draw your attention to is the employee contribution statement screen. When you log into PCSE Online as a GP, then one of the buttons that you will see in your landing pensions page will be the employee contribution statement button. And when you click on that, then you'll get the page will open similar to what we can see under um, point two here and that will auto populate with your own details. So your GMC number, your NHS pension scheme membership number, so your SD number as, as that's often called, they will auto populate and then you're able to filter on financial year. So obviously we're talking about 21, 22 at the moment, but it could you can filter on any year. Income type, so if you have combination of salaried post, some solo work and maybe even some locum work, then you can filter that separately just to look at your overall contributions, etc. If you have salaried posts in more than one practice, then you can also filter there and, and separate them out and then your pension scheme type in the end box. And when you click search to that, when you've done your filtering, then you will be shown all of the contribution lines for that particular year relating to the income type and the practice that you've selected. And what we would recommend is that if you have an accountant or advisor or practice manager or someone who, anyone who is supporting you to complete your type two submission or, you know, completing it for you, then it's important to take a few moments to download that employee contribution statement in its entirety. You can save it, email it to them, and that is really key for them when they're preparing your end of year figures and, and they can see exactly what has already been processed in the system by PCSE for you. The employee contribution statement is again important to flag really that when you think about practice contributions, 
when we had filtered on monthly salary, then the contributions that show in terms of employee, employer and any EVCs that you pay, then they what we'll show there is what has been deducted from the practice on the basis of the estimate that they submitted for 21-22. So every year the practices will submit estimates for all the, of the GPs and non-GP partners. And those estimates will say, you know, what the estimated annual income is for each person and the tier rate to be used. And then monthly deductions are taken from the practice payment based on that income and estimated income and the tier rate. Now, if for any reason you've ended up with a different salary, different payments, so it might have been adjusted throughout the year, but PCSE haven't been informed, you don't need to worry about that because you will, at source, you will have been deducted whatever the, the correct contributions are. But when it comes to reconciliation, then if there's any difference, um, so if it turns out that you know, PCSE have deducted less than, than you ended up paying across the year, then that difference will be taken from the practice as part of this end of year reconciliation. So it's important just to, to know that this is the what the employee contribution statement shows is what has been deducted so far from the practice, but the end of year reconciliation if there is any gap in, in those contributions, that will be deducted from the practice because you have already paid that. You've already had that taken in your monthly payroll. So as we said, download the, the statement and, and share it with your advisor. And this is just an example of 12 months of, of the year here for somebody who on the practice estimate, the we're showing as estimating 130,000 for the year at a tier rate of 14.5 and that shows how the monthly contributions play out there. The income type here is, is profit share so this happens to be a partner but it looks exactly the same if you select salary and key to, to remember is that whatever you see on this employee contribution statement in terms of the total row that we've highlighted in red here so employer contributions, employee contributions, and if there was any AVC contribution, then this is what will auto populate in your type two self-assessment as the contributions already paid, because as we've said, that's what's already been deducted. So that will auto populate when you come to your type two self-assessment screen. But before we get to that, then one of the things to mention, because we do, get some questions about it is that occasionally a GP might go to the employee contribution statement when they're starting to think about their end of year preparations and they can see that they are not showing as having that practice that they've been working at in the drop down. So effectively, they're not showing as attached to that practice. And what's key to understand in that is this all stems from the performer list employment details which is important to get right before we can actually get the pensions contributions started for you from practice. So if you find that you haven't been attached to the practice, that it's not showing in the employee contribution statements, then and you can check this at any point of the year. You don't I wouldn't necessarily wait till the end of the year, but some people obviously have only started to kind of have a look at PCSE online and, and have then realised and when that comes to light, the first thing to do is to go to your performer list record on PCSE Online. So when you log into PCSE Online, you will see two different big buttons. One will say performer list and one will say GP pensions. If you click on the performer list button, then you'll see the screen that's under point one here. And this is your performer homepage, your performer list homepage. And this is where you make all the performer management changes. So the first thing to check really is what's called change history. So if you click on that, you will be able to see if there are any employment changes that you've submitted to say that. So if you've already submitted an employment change to say that you had started working at a, the practice, then if that's still waiting approval, then you'll be able to see that there. If it is waiting approval, then it's a case of talking to the practice manager to let them know that needs to be approved. If it has been approved, then it's the pension joiner stage that needs to be looked at. But if it's 
either waiting approval, speak to the practice manager. If it's not there at all, if you haven't submitted it, if you weren't aware or, or hadn't realised, then you do need to submit an employment change, you know, noting the date that you started at the practice and that then needs to be approved before we can get onto the pension joiner form stage. If you've then got an approved employment change, so your performer list record is up to date as such, or when it's updated, if you have still got to go through it, then the, the practice can then complete a pensions joiner form, which then says, you know, from this particular date, this GP started at the practice, so that's already been confirmed on the employment change, but what the pension joiner form does is capture what is going to be the estimated income and tier rate so that the monthly contributions can be calculated. Now, there is a, there's a few changes going live in the system tomorrow night when the new end of year forms go live and one of them is an improvement to the pensions joiner form. So at the moment, practices have been restricted to only being able to complete pension joiner forms themselves on PCSE online within the same pension year. So if today somebody was trying to complete a pension joiner for a GP who actually started with them in January 22, then they wouldn't be able to complete that. But from Friday, then they will be able to complete that for the previous year. So it will be a lot easier from practice's point of view to resolve anything that needs done retrospectively, whereas up until now they've had to contact PCSE to, to do that. So if there are any practice managers or practice administrators online with us this evening, then I would urge you to have a look at the, the pension joiner form. It's really quick and easy to complete yourself and then you would know that the contributions will start from the next contractual payment, but they will also be backdated to make up for any months that have been missed, that haven't been taken yet, going back to the dates that the GP started. So just a, another kind of small improvement that we've made to the system to try and make people's lives a little bit easier and just get things done a bit quicker with less admin to do. So that's just a few bits of the, the background things that need to be in place and, and lined up to allow you to be able to go on and complete your self-assessment. When you go into PCSE online then and the pensions page, one of the options is self-assessment type two, so straightforward. When we click on that then, you have two buttons, so one is self-assessment and one is the, the listing screen. So self-assessment, if we're going to complete a brand new form, then we click on that and we will open up a screen that's that's displayed here at point three. Again, it will auto-populate and if you're logging in as the GP to complete, then it will auto-populate with your details with the practice that you're linked to. Um, if it doesn't show the practice or organisation that you are going to complete the form for, or not all of them, then you would just enter the ODS code into the search box and you'll be able to find the practice or organisation that you need. And then you would select the, the financial year. Now, we've just blown up the financial year box a little bit to let you see it's easier. and. What you can see here is that we've got 21, 22 in red. And as long as a financial year or a pension year is showing in red, then that means that you're good to go. The certificate hasn't been completed or, or it hasn't been started yet. There's, there's no draft. So you would just click on that and you would be able to carry on. If, however, when you've opened up that self-assessment page and you go to the financial year selection after you've selected the practice, if you then see this almost greyed out option next to the, your, the financial year you're looking for that says already initiated or completed, then that means, obviously it may be fully completed, but it, it usually means that there's a draft form that you've started. So you'd go to the listing screen. So again, just back to the self-assessment button and you've got these two options. You click on the listing button and when you open the listing screen, you get the option to search. You search for your own forms. You can just click search really without putting any 
kind of filtering criteria and if you like because you're unlikely to have pages and pages of of forms that take a long time to to load up so PCSE online only you know goes, goes back a few years so you can happily just click search that will return all of the forms that end of year forms certainly type 2 end of year forms that we have in the system for you and what you'll see then is in this example we've got this 2122 form that's showing under the declaration status as draft and that's kind of how it appears when you land on the screen but what you'll see if you look at that screen is there's a scroll bar along the bottom and if you move that scroll bar along to the right then you'll see that if it go, takes you past where it says draft and you'll be able to see a delete button so you've got two options if you've got a draft form here and, and the draft might just be that you've got as far as selecting the practice you might not have put any other data into it but the system then just that's the draft you've started it. So you can either just click on the, the blue form ID. So that's a, that would be a hyperlink in the live system and that will take you to the form that you've started and it will allow you to continue that. Or if for any reason you think, well, for whatever I've done or, or, or I can't remember or whatever, I, I just want to start again, then if you scroll along to find that delete button, just click that. As soon as you've clicked that, when you go back to the self-assessment button, then your the year that we're talking about, the year in question, will then become red again, and that will allow you to select it and start from the beginning. So you've got two options if it's in draft, but if you go to, I think the, the key thing, because we did get a lot of questions about this last year and you know some questions over the last few evenings, that if you go to try and complete the form and your financial year that you're looking at or looking for has this already initiated or completed then then that is a, a a signal an indication that you need to then go to the listing button and then when you click on that you'll be able to search for any forms that we have on file or in the system for you and either work from the draft or like i said delete it so hopefully that helps to clear that one up and another thing in terms of navigating around PCSE online that we get a lot of questions about is this, the status that your form shows when you have submitted it. So you've gone through and you know completed all of the, the data and you've ticked the box to say that you know that's all true and accurate and you've clicked submit. Once you've clicked submit, then when you go to that listing screen, you'll see the form that you've submitted and just after you've submitted it, it will show us having a declaration status of declarated. So you've completed the declaration, really, that's what that means. When that goes to that status, then you then are waiting for PCSE to review the form. So that stays there. You don't need to do anything else. That's you done. You just need to wait for PCSE to review the form. And when we've reviewed the form, then the status of your, the declaration status of your, your type two will either change to approved or hopefully or rejected. So that's, and if it's been approved, then you need to do nothing else that, that has gone through and there's no, no problems. If it has been rejected, then there'll be a note in the, uh, the note section to give a brief explanation. But the key thing about rejected forms is that you will see, and again, it just means that you need to scroll across to the end of the row underneath the listing screen. And when you scroll along, you'll see that there's a this little symbol that's in red under the revert to draft option. And when you've got that little symbol, if you click on it, then what that will do is it will create a new draft of your rejected form and it will allow you to then go and make any corrections, amendments, updates to the form and then you'll be able to resubmit. So it will populate with what you had submitted previously and then it will allow you to make those amendments. So that's how you get a rejected form back to the position where you can complete it and resubmit it. It's also the scenario I think that comes up from time to time where someone has a a form they've submitted that's approved and that's usually fine but if something comes to light for them where you know maybe their accountant points something out or whatever that they want to go back and make some amendments 
to that form and resubmit it, then if you have a type two that has a declaration status of approved, a type two that you've sent through on PCSE online and it has a declaration status of approved, if you scroll along again to the right to this action column, you'll see a resubmit button. And if you click that, your first submission will obviously be saved and that remains there. But if you click the resubmit button, then again, that effectively creates you a new draft, a new form for you to make any amendments and uh, submit that into us. So again, just some key bits around navigating when you have already submitted your form. OK, so to look at the all important calculation screen, then we've just tried to put some numbers against some of the figures to highlight for you. But what you will. So if we just look at what we've named as one, the point one, that will be your total pensionable pay. So from a practice when we're in row two, we're looking at, at your practice income as a salary GP. So from the practice, this will populate with the pensionable pay from the estimate. If you have earned more or indeed less than was estimated, then you would amend that figure and update that. In the middle column, so at point two, then that's the contributions already paid. And again, that will populate with what's already been deducted from the practice or when you go further down to the commercial rows, then what, what's already been processed. So what's already been deducted from the practice populates there. And then box three or point three is the amount that has been under or overpaid. Now, that will update once you've selected the tier rates, which is further down the form. So you can either ignore that for the time being or scroll down the form and select your correct tier rates and then that will update for you. But effectively, your if your contributions already paid are exactly what turns out to be due. So if you exactly earned what was on your estimated income, then that should be zero in the under or overpaid box, but obviously if you've earned more or indeed less than what's on the estimate, then there will be a difference there in that box. And then we look at the next row, then we're looking at solo work. So any solo work will populate in there and we'll come on to talk about adjustments in a moment, but just carrying on with the form. So you've then got locum, income so for anybody that does locum work then again the figures would populate there and you would make any updates if necessary and then point two on this screen we're looking really at, at row six and this is where the totals from all of the above basically will be added together automatically by the system so that will auto populate with your total pensionable pay, the total contributions already paid and then any any difference in, in employee contributions. Then looking at in point three AVCs, if the GP has contributed any AVCs, then that pulls through to there. And again, it would update if, if required. And then on here, we've got the at 7A, we've got the employer contributions paid and that will populate with the employer contributions that have been processed and paid already. And the last point on this section of the form, as we head towards the lower end of the form, then step eight mentions annualised GP pay. So if anyone doesn't have continuous membership for the full year, if we're looking at 21-22. So if you started later than 1st of April 21 or you ended earlier than the end of March 22, then you need to look at NHS pensions guidance on annualisation and they have the annualisation calculator and everything you will need to look at that. So that's obviously required to make sure that you are using the correct tier rate. And then the final part of the calculation screen is where we then select the tier rate first of all, and that will populate the employee contributions due with the correct figure based on where the income has ended up and then the in step 10 there'll be the overall employee contributions and overall employer contributions that are due and then 
where we've got in point three, these are the, the difference boxes. So the difference between what's been calculated as owed based on the actual income or the actual pension will pay and what's been paid already. And these are the, the differences. So the, the system will update and, and populate and make these calculations for you. But obviously, as you go along, then you are checking that this is what you're expecting to see and you're making any changes that you need to. When it comes to adjustments, so as we mentioned earlier on, the key purpose of these end of year forms is to do that reconciliation and make sure that the appropriate contributions have been paid for whatever turns out to be the, the pensionable pay that the GP has, has accrued for the year. So the type of work that the under or overpayment applies to will dictate how the adjustment is processed. So when it comes to salaried work, we've already alluded to, but the adjustments are made against the practice. So the practice will either have a, a deduction made in the next contractual payment after the certificate has been processed, if the contributions have been underpaid, or indeed if the contributions have been overpaid for the salaried work, then the practice would receive a refund in the next contractual payment. If the under or overpayment relates to solo work, then according to NHS pensions rules, that has to be resolved through the organisation that you did the work for. So they would either make the good the shortfall payment, so they would make a, an additional payment or indeed they would receive the refund in due course. And then for locum work, if it's a type 2 GP who has done some locum work and they have ended up with an underpayment of locum contributions. So they may be been submitting locum A and B forms on particular tier rates and then ended up at the end of the year, it transpires that they've earned a sum that's taken them into a higher tier rate. So that shortfall of contributions is the shortfall payment process. And we'll come on to look at that briefly, but the GP themselves needs to make that payment if it relates to locum work. And if GP has overpaid in locum contributions, then there is a, a refund process that is initiated once the certificate has been reconciled and processed. And then that goes through to NHS England because these don't forget when you make you if you do locum work and you pension it, then you make your a contribution payments to NHS England's bank account and that's paid over to NHS pensions. So if you have overpaid, then the refund is, is requested and, and initiated and, and NHS England will make that refund in due course. So that's how the adjustments work, just to make sure everybody's clear on that. And just looking at this locum shortfall payment then, so if you're a locum GP, you'll be used to submitting locum A and B forms to PCSE and payments to NHS England's bank account either every month or at whatever frequency that you do locum work throughout the year. But the locum contributions, as I said, have been paid at a lower rate. If you've underpaid effectively, then there is this template now that we need you to complete just to make sure that any additional payment you make in, in light of any locum shortfall to make sure that it is immediately identified that that's what it's for, which year it's for, you know, whether it's purely employee contributions, etc. The basic information around your SD number, pension scheme, membership number, etc. And that all important back reference. We do get ad hoc payments through or NHS England get ad, ad hoc payments through quite regularly and often not really with very much in the way of backing information. And that just leads to delays in, in PCSE being able to attribute the payments to the correct members records. And, and really what we want to, to make sure, what we want to make sure is that we get the members records updated as quickly as possible when these payments have been made. So locum shortfall payment templates, you'll find in the end of year guidance that we'll be posting the link to. I hope that you all actually saw the end of year communications that were sent out probably almost two weeks ago now because that had the link to the end of year guidance in it and the end of year guidance sets all of this stuff out. But we will include it again when we send the follow up note to the events. And I know that the my colleagues will be posting certain links in the 
the chat for the event so that you can see them and, and access them straight away if you haven't seen them already. So you complete the templates and make payment to NHS England's bank account and the guidance will, will make clear the BACS reference, but the format, instead of having LOC for locum in the middle after your SD number, it we are requesting that you put SHO for shortfall and that helps differentiate it between a normal locum payment. So we're not off looking for the locum forms that match to your locum payment that you've made, that we think that you've made in relation to locum forms. If we have if we can see that that's a shortfall payment, then we know what we're looking for. We're looking for the template, we're looking for the information and we can get your records updated promptly. So I think that is probably enough to say about the, the locum shortfalls. Just potentially talking about payments actually there, there is you'll see in the end of year guidance and, and this is more really for the colleagues and the practices that you work in but in when it comes to practice adjustments so when we're talking about where you know an estimate has been a bit under what a, a GP has ended up earning from the practice it's much more likely to apply to a, a GP partner so a type one GP but the you know there may be instances where a practice has forgot to resubmit an updated estimate when a GP has had a, either increased their working hours or, or something like that. So if that's the case, then as we've already discussed, adjustments would be processed in the practice's next contractual payment. That's the normal, that's the normal process. That's what NHS England expect to happen. But we are very conscious that from an accounting perspective, then practices are sometimes advised to make these payments up front or at the time of submitting the certificates because if you think back to that window that we talked about at the beginning where certificates have to be submitted by the 28th of February, PCSE have till about the middle of June to process them all and get about 30,000 or so through to process in that time. So we are processing right up until the cutoff usually and so depending on where in that period of a few months really particular certificates get processed then obviously it could be a few months down the line from end of February before the practice sees a deduction in, in their monthly payment so in some cases accountants will advise practices to pay that money direct to NHS England the same way as you as a GP would pay make locum payments they pay that money to NHS England and then PCSE have to identify which GP it's in relation to and, and get the records correct. So there is a, a shortfall, a shortfall, there's a an end of year payment template that looks a little bit similar to the locum one, but with a few different details in it. And the end of year guidance is is sets that out and sets that process out. And I mention it because if a practice is making end of year payments, so not waiting for the adjustment process to take place, then when you go to your contributions already paid part of your type two, you need to reflect the total amount. So you need to reflect what's been adjusted on a monthly basis, plus what's been paid in addition recently, if that makes sense, because that's the total that's already been paid. Otherwise, that contribution can then be deducted again from the practice, which is clearly not what anybody wants to happen. So that process is all set out in the end of year guidance. But I just wanted to mention it so that nobody would be surprised if the practice manager or, or whoever looks after that side of things, finance officer or whatever, speaks to you about it in terms of submitting your end of year. And I guess equally with the locum shortfall payments, if you look at the locum part to the, the contributions page in the, the type two form, then if you have made a shortfall payment, say for example, to, because of your employee contributions having been paid at a lower rate, then the total contributions that you've paid should include what's been processed through your employee contribution statement that you can see right now, but this additional shortfall payments that you've that you've submitted in. So I hope that's clear and that will hopefully help people make sure that the certificates can be reconciled a lot quicker. You don't get you know the same level of query back from PCSE because as long as we have very clear information from the practice around any end of year payments they've made and from locums around any shortfall payments they've made then it will be very easy to identify whose records we need to update and I guess just before we probably take a, a, a bit of a pause and, and see what questions we've got we've been focusing or I've been focusing on PCSE online 
mostly this evening in terms of the online solution and you know, it being a very straightforward way to complete your type two. But we do recognise that you know, some people who need to complete a type one or a type two form might still use the, the traditional route, which is to download a form from the NHS pensions website and then ha have it completed by your accountant or, you know, whoever does that for you and then upload it to the contact us form on the PCSE website. And just sort of bearing that in mind and recognising that, then we wanted to point out a few of the things that we've seen last year and, you know, in previous years where we've had to return forms at quite an early stage, really, in terms of, you know, an early stage of processing because there's been some missing information or details that, that aren't clear. And we just wanted to try and help people avoid that. So apologies if some of it sounds a bit low level and obvious, but these are genuinely real, you know, real things that, that do happen. So the first thing to remember, and it applies to type one or type two, that if the form doesn't have a wet signature from the pension scheme member, then it needs to be submitted from an NHS net address. And I guess what we mean by that when it comes to the contact us form is the contact us form, because you're not sending an email as such, are you? But the contact us form does have a box for the email address of the submitter and that needs to be an nhs.net address. It's recommended that it is anyway because if we need to go back to that's what we'd be using to correspond it needs to be an NHS net address to be able to correspond with you but importantly if the form doesn't have a wet signature then it has to and that it has to come from nhs.net and that's just the the rules set by nhs pensions so that's a key one some other key ones are probably point two point three are the most commonly missed fields on the form that people don't complete so it's quite common to get forms that don't have an sd number or don't have a, a national insurance number so box c has sort of a requirement for both of those so make sure that you fill them in and um, if you do if you're using PCSE online to complete your submissions then as we showed earlier these will auto populate but if you're completing a manual form as we might call it then make sure you include them if you don't know what your SD number is because I've spoke to lots of GPs who don't know and, and the practice manager might not know then the easiest thing to do is to log into PCSE online go to your employee contribution statement and Boxes that auto populate include your GMC number for your GP, but your NI number and your NHS pension scheme membership number, which is your SD number. When it comes to your SD number, you would also find it on certain correspondence from NHS pensions, of course. And then the ODS code of the practice or practices, if you work at multiple practices or solo providers, etc., then you know, check the practice manager or the manager of the organisation if you're unsure of the, the code to enter. And then some of the specifics further down this list of top tips apply in terms of the box references to the type one form, but there are similarities or similar things you need to just remember when it comes to type two. So we've already mentioned about annualisation and people making sure they check the annualisation calculation if they don't have continuous membership for the year but we also have and and you know dates that you've sort of, sort of started and left but we also have you in when it comes to type two the approved leave section and I just recommend that anybody who has a period of approved leave and they need any support or assistance on that then make sure you refer to NHS pensions guidance that's where you would you would get information to help you with that and the other thing which seems the most low level of all but it has to be mentioned because it does happen that you know we do get some forms through the contact us route and it's not possible to make out some of the figures or some of the data so it seems you know absolutely obvious but just for the avoidance of doubt it, it everything needs to be completely clear for us to be able to start processing so Hopefully some helpful things for anybody who does end up using the contact us form, but we hope that with some of the pointers you've picked up tonight about navigating PCSE online, that you'll be able to give that a go and, and we trust you'll find that straightforward. This is just a screenshot of the guidance that I referred to, so we'll put the link to that in the chat. And I think that's probably a good time for us to 
and perhaps think about any of the questions that have come through. Debbie, I know we've racing on with, with time. We've tried to go into a little bit more detail this evening based on quite a few of the different questions that we got last night. So we've tried to cover some of that stuff. Yes, we've had lots of wonderful questions come through. So thank you for Janet that's been working tirelessly in the background answering those. I've tried to pick out a few common trends, so I am conscious of time, so I will jump jump on straight onto those. Now, the first question that I've got for you, Katrina, is I only qualified as a GP in June 2022. When will I be required to submit to Type 2? Yep, to so June 22, so that will be the 22-23 pension year which will be completed around about this time or will be released, the forms will be re released at this time next year. So nothing to complete for the 21-22 year at the moment because that only, that cuts off at the end of March. So it'll be the next year again. So there wouldn't be any options to select for self-assessments for that GP because they, they're not, they don't have any forms to, to complete yet, but they will be able to see the current uh, contributions in the employee contribution statement. Fantastic, thank you. So one that we've come through, it says, if I do some work at a hospital trust that I pay a pension on, will this show on PCSC online? In the short answer, no. <laughs> the explanation for that is that PCSC online only and PCSE only administer contributions in relation to practitioner posts. So any work it's a trust would be and, and posts like that would be an officer post. So you wouldn't see it on PCSE online, but you would see it on your your TRS and I believe NHS pensions have got a new app in development that pension scheme members are going to be able to see all of the contributions in future, but it's just important to realise that the anything through the trust would be officer work and that kind of goes to NHS pensions via the trust payroll, whereas practitioner work comes through PCSE and that's the only bit that you'd be able to see on PCSE online. Lovely, thank you. So the next one mentions NHS trust, so it says I have a contract with an NHS trust one day a week. Do I need to include that when calculating my tier rate? No, not for your tier rate for your type two form. So again, just linked to the previous question, really, that's a, a separate officer post and your type tier form would only include any work from your practitioner posts and your tier rate is only calculated based on the income from those posts. Again, I just I just add there, Debbie, that that's a, these are all factual statements. I'm comfortable with that and I know that Janet would be comfortable with the explanation, but I would strongly encourage people who've got any questions of, of that nature to be looking at NHS pensions guidance just so that they're they're absolutely clear on their own circumstances. No that's great Katrina thank you. So the next one is if I use PCSE online for this do I need to send anything on the contact us form like I did in previous years? Okay so I presume that by for this we mean to submit my type 2 form so on that basis no, your record of what you've submitted is your listing screen as we've we've looked at in the, the slides and that's when you see that gone through to declarated status, then that guarantees you that that's landed with PCSE. There's absolutely no reason whatsoever that you need to send us something in the contact us form to tell us that you've used PCSE online. So that saves you plenty of time. So thanks Debbie and I'm sorry to kind of rush to the end because we've we've obviously had a lot to cover, but I'm just going to share my screen again. OK, so I have logged in here. This GP has logged in, test account here, but going to self-assessment type two. And if we go to self-assessment, then we'll find that if I select the financial year, if I just scroll that down a bit so people can see better, then I've got this already initiated, completed uh, message because I started this draft earlier on today. So if I go back to self-assessment and go to the listing screen, just press search. You can see what I meant there by when you look at it at first, you say, well, that's a draft. I don't know, you know, what can I do with that? So I can click the, the hyperlink to open it to continue or I can scroll along like that and click to delete. Confirm I want to delete it. And then, then we should be able to go straight back to our self-assessment button. 
So you see again what we were talking about, our details auto populate, the practice that we've worked at, etc. So that's in red now. So that 21, 22 is in red. What I probably didn't mention earlier on is that some of this will auto populate too. So if you have had any period of leave, then if you tick yes, you will be directed to complete the authorised leave tab. But if you say no, then this pension uh, scheme that we have on record that you remember of will populate um, and you'll be taken to the, the appropriate tab. So if we say save and next, this test GP is a member of the 2015 scheme. If we say save and next to that, then that will take us through to this contributions page. There we are. And we've then got the total pensionable pay contributions already paid have auto populated, as we'd said. And like I mentioned, we ignore the figure that's in 2B because that calculation doesn't show true until we've selected the tier rate. So if we ignore everything else for a second and go down and select a tier rate of 14.5, then what we should see here is that that then updates. So if this was the happiest of all happy paths, this GP earned exactly what was on their estimate uh, or what the practice submitted on their estimate. What we've deducted every month comes exactly to the contributions that are due because the tier rate was correct on the estimate too. And, you know, that obviously is the most straightforward scenario. We check everything else is, is correct, but we are then not seeing any difference at all to be paid and that would just be submitted. Now, obviously, as we'd said earlier on, if it turned out that, you know, and instead of the 120,000 that was estimated, that I ended up earning, say, 135, then what will happen then if we just go back down to check the tier rate? Yeah, that's still stayed at 14.5 of selected. So that's calculating now that I I'm due to pay 19,575 on employee contributions. We scroll up the contributions that have already been paid through the practice, 17,400. So that means I've got two, there's a £2,175 underpayment. And as I say, the normal process would be for the for these then to be processed as adjustments against the practice in the next contractual payment. However, if the practice tells me that actually they've made that payment across to NHS England, then what I would be doing is going into the contributions already paid and updating that also. So the figure, as my memory is terrible, would be, they would tell me that they've paid another 2175. So that means that my contributions already paid would be 19575. So I need to just update that to reflect it. And then you see how that changes back to zero again in terms of the over or under payment. So that would get rid of that underpayment. But if if there's been no payment made by the practice, then no end of year payment made by the practice, then that would be the 17,400 that had been deducted over the months. And the 2,175 in employee contributions is what would be due to be taken as an adjustment. And of course, because that's a, an increase in the income compared to the estimate, then there's also going to be an underpayment of the employer contributions, which the calculation is also done for us to say employers on that 145,000 would be 19,413, but we've already paid the 17,256 and the difference there is, is 2,157. So hopefully you can see how easy it is to use PCSE online just to get through the form, very straightforward. And as I say, you would then have that immediate record that that's been submitted. I hope you found it helpful. Huge thanks to Debbie and Kat and to Janet for all the support. And what we'll be doing is over the next couple of days, pulling together the elements of the webinars and other supporting guidance, and we'll send you a follow up email so that you have access to that. So thank you again and wish you all a very good evening. Thank you.